appreciate this opportunity to discuss with you the difficult subject of chemical weapons, and I'm afraid I interrupted someone who is probably better able to at this than I am. I know some of you have recognized the importance of this issue and strongly supported maintaining a deterrent capability, while others of you have had concerns about this and hoped that other nations would follow our lead and refrain from the use of these weapons. In that regard, our foremost goal regarding chemical weapons is to negotiate a comprehensive, verifiable plan or ban on the production and storage and use of these terrible weapons. Our draft chemical weapon treaty tabled in Geneva by Vice President Bush was a significant step toward uh, such a ban. But our desire to rid the world of these weapons has not yet been matched by Soviet willingness to join us in constructive negotiations at the Conference on Disarmament. For 16 years, we have unilaterally refrained from producing these weapons. Unfortunately, we've witnessed no slowdown in Soviet production and use of new chemical munitions. Equally distressing, the list of nations possessing these weapons and hostile to our national interest continues to grow. The lessons of history, I think, are clear on this subject. Our own experience in World War I demonstrated the horror of these weapons. More than a quarter of all our casualties in that war were caused by gas warfare. A chemical war can be deterred, and I think the <coughs> greatest example of deterrence and effective deterrence was World War II, when we know that every nation in that war was possessed of those weapons, and they were never used. And the threat of retaliation, I think, in kind can prevent the use of these munitions. Sadly, in Cambodia, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Iraq, forces unable to respond in kind have suffered horribly. The state of our deterrent, therefore, is of great importance to this nation's security. I welcome the call by Congress to establish the Chemical Warfare Review Commission. Our national policy in this critical area must be clear and based on a full understanding of the threat and our appropriate response. The work of the Commission has been critically important in this regard. You've already heard, I interrupted Ambassador Stessel discuss the conclusions reached by his commission. The distinguished members of this bipartisan commission have completed an independent, thorough reassessment of the facts regarding our chemical stockpile and the deterrence of chemical war, and have concluded unanimously that the production of modern binary munitions is urgently needed in order to restore this nation's chemical deterrent and enhance the chance of achieving a ban on chemical weapons. I strongly endorse their findings that a modernized chemical stockpile will best prevent use of these ter terrible weapons against our forces and those of our allies and increase the possibility of successfully instituting or negotiating a ban on these weapons. Our program will result also in a much smaller but more reliable stockpile of chemical munitions. As you've heard, the majority of funds that we're requesting are for chemical defense and the destruction of obsolete weapons. And let me make one final point before taking your questions. At present, our inadequate deterrent invites first use against the men and women in our armed forces. We ask them to respond to such a despicable attack with weapons of incorrect type and insufficient number. The mere transport of these munitions that we have now endangers both soldiers and citizens. The situation is intolerable and can only grow worse. We must act now to correct this problem and to put this issue behind us. And I hope you will ensure that our troops will not again suffer the horrors of chemical warfare and will support our request in this year's defense bill. So, now, the meeting's open. Did we answer all the questions? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Um, you mentioned that I've got to have something to vote against. And they have chosen the chemical, 
Secretary is laughing because I'm sure we've heard, we've all heard. I have chosen the chemical issue as the one vote that I'm going to cast aside. Uh, what can we do to answer those questions or those, those allegations? What can we do to say that the strength uh, and the importance of this issue is almost of the magnitude of, of MX or, or is greater than, minor than, equal to that issue? Well, I think what we have to say to them is this isn't a case of, uh, you know, should you try for two points after the touchdown or one? Uh, this is a case of that every single issue in the state of our defenses and what they had declined to, we have to look at every one and see how vital it is. Now right now, and correct me if I'm assessing this wrong, right now our situation is that yes, we have in storage chemical weapons, but they're not binary. They are the, and they're deteriorating, age has taken its toll, that we have had to remove some already, but we're faced with the possibility, let's say, in transit and so forth, of weapons that a leak or an accident or something can cause tremendous damage. And the weapons we're talking about are weapons that have the safety factor that they have to be mixed before they're lethal. And so do we, just because someone has supported us on our view that we needed help in, uh, in the uh, nuclear deterrent, something of that kind, that now we must uh, put up with this deteriorating situation that does represent a great hazard and represents also the fact that in the face of chemical warfare, and I'm quite sure that our opponents are aware of this, they know we haven't been building, they know that we cannot adequately respond, so they, they're kind of home free if the situation ever arises. You, Mr. President, I was asked the other day when I was talking to some of my colleagues about this issue, how we plan to dispose of the existing deteriorating stockpile that we have. And I was going to ask you or somebody could... How to dispose of it? How they will dispose of it. Will we um, go on that side I'm, or someplace I'm going to ask for some help on this question here because the, the technology of getting rid of those weapons is... Yeah. Um, there is a program now for disposing of the dangerous weapons, uh, those that are leaking and uh, are actively hazardous. Uh, the, the method used is uh, incineration. Uh, there are special incinerators, uh, very high heat, and uh, the process is a very safe one. It's, it's going through all the EPA requirements and so on. Uh, our recommendation in, in our report is that this process of destruction be accelerated, uh, which would mean building more incinerators and uh, speeding up the process. Would that be on the site or would that be? No, they have to be taken to. It has to be in another It's a very location. expensive process, but it, it does have to be done because these are more dangerous than, than to us. Uh, they, they were concerned about the transporting yeah. of them, because there is a risk. It's, it's, it's uh, why it costs so much. It, yes, they're, they're, no, they, 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 they'll be done in a very safe way, but in a very expensive way. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. President, uh, Duncan Hunter from San Diego. Uh, I think that one thing we've, we've failed to emphasize enough in the past debates has been the safety issue, the binary issue. The fact that you got two elements until you put them together, you don't have uh, you don't have a lethal gas. Whereas we have many areas in the United States that right now are yeah. are repositories for nerve gas. Okay. And when the killer amendment is offered uh, in the next couple of days in the House floor by Mr. Porter and Mr. Fassell, uh, Mr. Skelton, uh, the Democrat on the Armed Services Committee, myself are going to offer a substitute. The substitute is going to say that we're going to go ahead with the funding. Uh, but that we are we were are going to require that the harmless elements, the, the binary elements, be stored in separate states, and that means that the that the mayor of Pine Bluff, uh, Arkansas, instead of having nerve gas in his state as he or in his city as he has right now, will have uh, the element that is similar to sulfur or insecticide, which is one of the uh, one of the uh, binary elements, and the and the uh, the gentleman who is a mayor in in Utah will have one of the other elements. 
and that these elements will not be put together until, in fact, uh, we are moving forward to deploy them in a forward area. And this is going to solve, I think, a great deal of the, a great many of the fears about transportation and about location. In fact, I think mm -hmm. it would be uh, it would uh, if, if people's constituents knew what they're voting for. If they vote against it in this yeah, mode, it's going to be doing them a real disservice, especially if they live in the towns in which the nerve gas. Uh, or aside. Now we got a letter, as I understand, that Dr. Welch told me just now from the Secretary of the Army saying that this is feasible, it can be done. And I think that message should be put out to the American people that now instead of having nerve gas in your particular state, you're going to have one of the binary elements that in itself is relatively harmless. Well, both, both elements are harmless until they're mixed. Uh, and uh, the mixture doesn't take place until the projector was launched. And uh, in, in a sense, Dr. That is, that is feasible, uh, but it isn't all that practical uh, from the point of view of having a, a ready retaliatory capability. But uh, uh, it, it, yes, it can be done. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, I don't want to estimate what's necessary to get to, uh, to reject the killer amendment, as you put it. But uh, the, the, these are harmless, mm -hmm. even though they're stored next to each other. Uh, and the tiller put into a projectile and the projectile's launched. That's why you can transport them so much more. I understand that, I think, but I think the way to make that message clear to the, to the American people is to, is to be able to give <coughs> the governors and mayors uh, the fact uh, that they're the, the assurance that this stuff will be stored in separate states. Anyway, I think it's going to be necessary, Cap, to get that 15 or 20 maybe, votes maybe, maybe. Uh, to knock that amendment. Could I just comment, it would seem to me, to do with this thing, you could follow that practice, but you certainly could minimize uh, the uh, the distance that they're apart. They don't have to be 800 miles apart. So they could be much closer. There's a place in the West that's been present in our four states come together. Now, Mr. President, I'm afraid you all Ohio. I have a, this concern. We presently have unitary weapons in Europe. Now, if this plan were to be implemented, we would withdraw those, destroy them. I think we'll have a great problem in deploying binaries in Europe because of the same kind of drill we went through with the Lecums and the Pershings. And uh, secondly, if we don't deploy these, if, uh, as the unitaries presently are at the front, we run the risk of, if, if kept in the United States, that taking them to the front would trigger a possible Soviet reaction in the event of a wartime mode. So I think I have a real concern about that overall pattern that would be a necessity of either uh, the absence of being able to deploy the, the binaries <coughs> as opposed to the fact that the unitaries are already there. And secondly, the, the, the implications of deployment during wartime. Well, I would think that any local opposition to that would be lessened by the fact that you were replacing what could be a hazard to the nearby community with something right. with a great, much greater degree of safety. But do we have any agreement with these countries to accept binaries? You don't have to, sir. Uh, you have, uh, you would, because you can transport them much more quickly and much more safely than you can get. You can also preposition uh, the binaries on ships uh, and uh, have them somewhat closer to the place where they would be needed. But uh, you don't you don't have to preposition the you don't have to have them deployed in Europe the way the others are. Yeah, but if you introduce them during wartime, that is uh, I think would be a very bad signal. And personally, I think we'd well, be better to have them where they are presently. We would have no no objection, obviously, to their being there. But the Europeans do, and we are That's trying right. to reduce some of the uh, sore points and abrasions, and they're very justified in worrying about having the unitaries deployed where they are now. I, could I add one thing to that, Mr. Yes. President? And that is that uh, in dealing with this subject with the NATO Military Committee, they've consistently said, you know, don't press our politicians for an agreement before you produce those weapons, but for heaven's sake, get them produced, and then we can deal with that issue later on. But if they're never produced, they can certainly never be stored here, and uh, so it's easier to prevent it by never having them produced, but every NATO military leader recognizes the need for producing these weapons and about, not having a deterrent. about the political leaders? That's well, where you have the problem. I recognize <laughs> that, uh, but uh, what I would say to you is that everyone recognizes the need for them and that the political problem, now there is no political problem if they're never, yeah. they're never produced, so let's produce them 
and then deal with that later on. And I just remind you of one thing, and then I'll take this question. I know I'm running out of time here, but one thing also that we have to remember in talking about voting on this, and that is that there is one country, the one country that we have asked to join us in a treaty banning these weapons, and which has refused to do that, is the company or is the country that is producing them regularly and on quite a, uh, quite heavily, and uh, is armed with them, which I think should emphasize that there is a reason for us to seek a deterrent. Is the Soviet binary or unitary? Uh, unitary. They don't worry so much about environmental, <laughs> or whether you kill a few standby. <laughs> President Jan Myers, Overland Park, Kansas. Um, how many weapons are we requesting in the bill? And the reason I ask is because my constituents say to me, the ones that are opposed, I'm, I'm sure there's probably some support in my district too, but the ones that are opposed say that if you destroy all of the current defective weapons, that we still have three to 500,000 of viable chemical rockets and bombs. And, and I don't know the number that we're requesting, and I don't know the accuracy of those figures. Well, I think I've just had a chance to glance at this. I think what we're talking about here is a, is a comparison of existing stocks of unitary and the planned stockpile of binary munitions. Yes, uh, Usually, Mr. President, there's a small classification problem as to the actual numbers, but the, the chart accurately represents the, the proportions and the percentages that all of the new ones would be militarily useful, but they would be in that proportion to the existing stuff. So the new one is the existing, and that's what we'd be getting rid of. And we'd be coming down to that arena. I see. Um, the the <coughs> comment is made, of course, in trying to prove the point that we already have a deterrent and that it is a viable deterrent and why are we going to an <coughs> untested, unproven, uh, smaller number of uh, weapons uh, to be a deterrent when we already have one. Um, I wanted to ask you because I don't know the accuracy of all of that. Well, I think that one reason is that many of these weapons are deteriorating age-wise to the point we don't that have a lot of yeah. that, that's the real problem. That they're just, uh, it's like finding that your ammunition, yeah. the, uh, that the bullets are duds, uh, is what we're, we're afraid of with the supply that has been there so long. It's the, the atomic weapons. And uh, so many of our people, uh, as uh, you have, uh, and the rest of us have found out, who have been opposed to uh, nuclear weapons uh, are also opposed to systems which uh, don't uh, use nuclear weapons. In fact, uh, we had uh, a little piece on the front page of the New York Times uh, this morning uh, indicating uh, that uh, some uh, distinguished uh, staff people uh, in uh, Congress uh, say that uh, uh, our uh, land-based uh, missiles are no longer valuable Somehow they have decided uh, that uh, they don't work. So if, if uh, these people are really against nuclear weapons and they want to lower, they, they want to raise the threshold against uh, nuclear warfare, this is the best way to go. I hope that works. Yes, I, uh, I see that point and I agree completely. I, I just think the fact that you look at the Soviet Union and you see the progress that they've made, and again, I'll stand corrected if I'm wrong, and it's the progress they've made in protective gear and clothing for their <coughs> soldiers on the NATO line against chemical warfare indicates that they've not ruled out the possibility that someday it may happen. You, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, following up on uh, Jan Myers, this may be a question as much for Ambassador Stessel as yourself. Uh, excuse me, I'm John Miller, Seattle. Uh, I think on the negotiations uh, issues, the arms control issues, uh, the arguments cut very strongly in favor of going ahead. Uh, the, the harder issue is the dollars and cents, whether it's <coughs> spending. 
And that gets back to this issue of whether for these hundreds of millions of dollars, ultimately over a billion, we get a significantly greater deterrence. The opponents are arguing that right now, with our present stockpile, even though some may be leaky and some may not be deliverable, as your report acknowledged, there are enough chemical weapons to cover the battlefields of Europe, the short range. I think your, your report says that. So the question then is, if there is that sufficiency in the present uh, stockpiles, uh, then in terms of dollars and cents, uh, why go uh, for this extra? And again, either you or, or the ambassador, maybe you wrote the report that could reply to that. Thank you. Uh, well, again, uh, I would have to say that uh, we should pay attention to the inadequacies of what we have now. I mean, there, there are uh, some short-range weapons. Um, the rate of use and how many uh, miles of battlefield these could cover obviously would depend on the type of the battle and the scenario and so on. Uh, but it is a very limited uh, capability uh, which we now have in Europe. And uh, as I was saying, the range is very short. Uh, many of these short-range weapons do not have the right kind of agent in them. So while there certainly is a deterrent present, it is not a very impressive one. And if you have to think of replacing this, transporting it, uh, replenishing the stocks, uh, it's simply too dangerous. Uh, you really have to go to the binaries to have that safety and ease of transport. And what you're saying is that present deterrent in your opinion, is not sufficient to deter, uh, give assurance of deterring the Soviet uh, chemical weapons right. attack. The old right. problem of measuring it entirely by numbers of war, and if you've got to look at the effectiveness and usefulness of war. Listen, I'm going to have to leave you with you. I'm doing the right. Rose Garden here. But with regard to deteriorating ammunition, I'm probably the only one in the room, mm -hmm. <laughs> practically, I, I think entirely, that can say this, but then, after World War I, before there was a World War II, I was a reserve officer in cavalry, and I can remember being out on the pistol range. And speaking of deteriorating ammunition, with a 45 automatic on the range and shooting, you'd be surprised how many times you'd get one shot out, and then your gun was jammed, and you'd look in there, and the next cartridge that was coming up from the magazine into the barrel, the brass case had just peeled and caught and it was jammed. And if you were doing that to somebody else who had a gun coming the other way, you wouldn't have had time to get out your knife and dig this bullet out there and see if the next one would work. So uh, ammunition can deteriorate, and you can find that when you really need it, uh, maybe it jams. So uh, please excuse me. Thank you. <laughs>